Hello and welcome to Improving Your Dating Radar. Doesn't that sound like a great idea? Wouldn't you just love to know that your radar is right on? And I'm here with my colleague, Sandy Wiener from lastfirstdate.com. And doesn't that sound like a great thing? Wouldn't you like to be going on your last first date because you're so madly in love with the absolutely right person? <laughs> And so I was just about to hold that up for you, but you did it. So you find her at lastfirstdate.com, and you can find me at forrelationshiphelp.com. And uh, there are lots of resources for you that we both bring in. I'm excited about our conversation today because people do have dating fears, and rightly so, wouldn't you say, Sandy? Oh, my God. So many, <laughs> so many. And, you know, I run a Facebook group called Your Last First Date. Here's a Here's a link to that one. And um, it's it's amazing the conversations that have been going on in there have all been about fears of dating again and uh, fears of opening your heart up again. So there's so many things to talk about in regard to fear. And fear and love don't work really well together. They're kind of opposites. Yeah, they are. They are. One kind of pushes against the other. Yeah, so... So for you listening, if you're having some kinds of fears about going on dating, know that you're in really good company. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a wise thing to have. Not that you want to keep it, but it's a wise thing to take notice of so that you can do something about. And I know, Sandy, you as a dating coach work with people who are having these fears. So um, what do you think the first thing that people need to do when they realize they have these fears is? Well, first of all, I love that you said that you can do something about it. And that's that's the operative word is that we feel disempowered when we're afraid. And knowing that you can actually create a better outcome gives you a lot of power. And so we're going to talk about that. So what was the question you asked me? <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what's the good of recognizing that in what's the good in recognizing that you have fears? So, and yeah. Okay. So th thank you for reminding me of the question. Uh, yeah. So recognizing that you have a fear is the first step. Noticing, naming it um, is the first step in being able to do something about it. So if you just feel caught up in that fear and you're in a panic state and mm -hmm. you're living in scarcity, like there, there are not enough people to date, um, I'm running out of time, I'm not enough, people reject me. Um, then you just fall into that victim hole of, um, you know, not being able, you feel paralyzed that it, it's everything, everyone else has control over you. Um, so I'm sure you find, you find that in your practice too, Roberta. Well, I do. And, you know, I think that people, when they're in that situation, and if you don't bring it to consciousness and you don't say, oh my goodness, I've got these fears and let me enumerate them let me count the ways i'm afraid to date um that that we can't take responsibility for the fact that we are putting that message out that we are not good enough we are not enough all of that will go out there and we don't want to be doing that because that attracts the wrong thing you know sandy in my work i specialize in working with the partners the exes the adult children co-workers of what I call chronically difficult people and I trademark the term hijackles for them and these are people who hijack relationships for their own purposes while relentlessly scavenging for power status and control so you may have come by your fears very 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 wisely you may have been preyed upon by a hijackle at some point or in relationship with one, or married to one, or have the hijackal be the mother or father of your children. And when that happens, you do become fearful because you know your picker might be off. You know, <laughs> you're, I, I call that, you know, I, I invite people to work with me at that point because if you've survived and gotten out of a relationship with a hijackal, you don't want to any longer be hijackal bait. So you may very well have a fear that's well-founded and it's good to know up front and get help before you throw yourself back into the dating pool and attract what you had before that didn't work. Correct. 
Right. And so recognizing what went wrong is, is a big first step. And I actually was having this conversation with my oldest daughter and her father has been dating somebody for many years and is afraid of marriage because of our marriage failing. Well, he failed to take responsibility for what went wrong. And so you can walk around saying, well, I never want to marry again because marriage is horrible and because people are just going to turn around and tell you they don't love you after a certain amount of years. And so I need a guarantee that nobody will ever leave me again. And Good luck um, with that. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, you know, number one, take responsibility because no matter what happens, even in that hijackal type of relationship, it takes two. You know, you were attracted to that person for a reason. And not to blame, but to recognize what needs of mine were being met. Why did I get attracted to that person? And how can I make better choices? And, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, the fact that my ex-husband is still angry with me after almost nine years, I feel bad for him. <laughs> I really do, because I'm not angry. I, I've moved on. I've created an amazing life. And, you know, and that's that's something that I, I really recommend that people do is they create their own fantastic life that um, is vibrant and alive. And, and um, you know, you're doing what you love. You are communicating well. I mean, that's a huge part of, of healthy relationships is learning to speak up ask questions, check things out. Um, you know, you don't have as many fears when you are get when you get curious. Uh, so one of the fears is rejection. Like that's a biggie. I just want to put that one out there. I'm going to be rejected. And, yes. um, and this was a big topic of discussion today on my Facebook group uh, because somebody felt rejected. And um, when I started to ask her questions about this relationship, she said, well, the guy was newly divorced and he told her right off the bat That's that he was number one. Yes, exactly, and he was not ready for a committed relationship. She went in anyway. He told maybe her she, she could change his mind. Yeah, and and he kept saying she was fantastic and beautiful and wonderful, and it never went anywhere. And then suddenly he's disappearing, and um, and I think he met somebody else. So she feels awful. Why does this keep happening to me? Well, there's a pattern. You chose an emotionally unavailable man. And you need to look within and, and ask yourself, what's going on for me? Like, how am I abandoning myself emotionally? I mean, that's a good question to ask. How am I not valuing myself enough to set clear standards about how I want to be treated? Why do I keep going after people who are not available? Yeah, and those are really good questions to ask yourself. And I would say, you know, step back. Don't be in a rush to get into the dating pool. Reflect on where you have come from and how you got into your previous relationship that didn't work and what it is that you want and what you don't want and be very clear about it. And then when you do get back in the dating pool, leave your rose-colored glasses at home. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we're always... A little bit anxious when we're out dating, you know, will people like us, all of those kinds of things. There's a there's a certain level of normality to that because we're risking something. But if we find that we're off the charts, fearful of that, if we find that even getting ready to go out, we're looking in the mirror and saying, hmm, meh, uh, you know, <laughs> we're not ready to go. And there's no timeline that has to be in your life. And so many people think, oh, well, the biological clock is ticking, or I'm a certain age, or if I don't do it now, or whatever. And those are the things that get you into settling for a relationship that you probably knew, at least subconsciously, if not consciously, was not the best for you. So you don't want to repeat that. Yeah. Take the time to think it through. Get good help. You know, what you're talking about with your group there, Sandy, and the clients that you work with, you walk them through all of that, don't you, to really examine what's going on before they put themselves out there to attract what they had before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you need a good support squad. So you don't you don't want your your girlfriends who are going to bash all the guys that you go out with. Well, he was a jerk anyway. I never really liked, him. or family members, or anybody who's going to 
who's going to just um, be there as a cheering squad against men. Um, we also had a discussion recently about, I, I can't stand men, men are horrible. And then of course, everybody starts chiming it. Yeah, I feel the same way. And I just jump in and say, let's take a step back here. You know, first of all, don't don't sweep with a broad brush. You know, you don't want to put all men into the same pool as the man who hurt you. And also, again, take a step back. What did you do? Did you allow him to treat you poorly and then tolerate and tolerate and you're a people pleaser and you just smiled when you really hurt and he showed up late and you were really angry and you didn't say anything? And, you know, there are things that happen that you probably haven't addressed. And then you wonder um, why he treated you that way. And then you want to blame him or her for treating you that way. And I think it's very important for every single one of us, dating or not, to remember we're 100% responsible for teaching people how to treat us. Yeah. And if you don't speak up, you just said it's okay. And don't be surprised when people keep treating you that way. Don't blame them. You didn't stop them. You had no boundaries. And I think many people in the dating world, Sandy, are, are too boundaryless. They're, they're casting a wide net and they're saying, well, let me see who's out there. Let me, let me be attractive to everybody and then I'll choose. And you really have to have some boundaries. Yeah. You have to know where it's okay with you and what's not okay with you. And that is not something that's negotiable. If it's not okay with you, don't accept it this time. Or maybe he didn't mean it. Or maybe she's not always like that. No, if you see it, note it. It's happening. And that's what I mean about leave your rose-colored glasses at home. Because when we're in that state of dating, we are so happy to justify and rationalize the poor behaviors of others. Right. And and that that's a pattern we don't realize often until we're quite far in and sometimes too late. Yeah. So when you, exactly, I mean, when you've been tolerating behaviors and you're not stating your values and what's important to you, if a person crosses over a line, then that's something to work on. And that's where the empowerment comes. Um, and and practice I wanna, with your mother. Yes, <laughs> probably. <yeah. laughs> practice with family members, 100%. That's like, I always say, you know, if you can't, if you can't work it out at home, it's going to be really hard to work it out in the outside world because those are where your biggest buttons are pushed. And, you know, your children, your, you know, your parents, anybody who really pushes buttons, who knows you really well, who loves to crush down those boundaries and, and violate. I, I just, my mother just um, went online. Um, so for the first time I, I, I got her set up on, on online dating. And she's been married twice. Her husband died about two years ago. And I know that if I don't set a clear boundary, she's going to call me every five minutes. And I don't understand. Why is he not calling me? And why is this guy not writing back? And how do I do? So what I did was I set clear boundaries. And I, I also videotaped with her a Zoom meeting showing her. I shared the screen and I showed her how to navigate through the online dating world. And I said, watch this video if you have any questions. I also don't want to hear about any of her dates. I don't want to hear about sex. I don't want to hear about anything that crosses a boundary. Right? But I have to say it because if I don't, it will happen. It will happen. And so we need to we need to do it, even with people who love to cross boundaries, who don't see the boundaries that they don't because it doesn't matter to them. Um, it doesn't matter. If it matters to you, then you have to know what you want to do about it. That's right. And many of us are not very good at setting boundaries. No. You know, if, if I think about my entire practice over these last 35 years, one of the top topics is boundary setting. Because we, as you said earlier, we're raised to people please. And let's all be frank. Children need to people please in order to survive. It's something that we learn when we're little. You got to keep those giants happy or they might not feed you or they might not take you or they might not do everything. So it's the survival skill. People pleasing is a survival skill when you're young. But there is a psychological point at which, in fact, too, that you need to individuate. And at those times, then you start understanding 
I don't need to please that person. I need to have communication with that person. And then you begin to be assertive. And that would be the second big thing that I think we need to understand is you have the right to be assertive. And when you're dating, you're afraid to be because you want them to like you. And you don't want to offend them. And it's too early to really let them know what you think or whatever you're telling yourself in your head. But we have the right to be assertive, every one of us. And what assertive means is that you will speak on your own behalf about yourself only. Here is what I think. Here is what I feel. Here is what I need. Here is what I want. And in my book, Kaizen for Couples, I have two chapters on that. And I developed that because it's really essential. I don't like the idea of iMessages. We used to teach them in corporate training and everything. I didn't like it. So I developed what I call the, pers the personal weather report. And that is to go within and answer those four questions. What am I thinking? What am I feeling? What do I need? What do I want right now? Mm -hmm. And to become conscious of being able to do that. And never to say a word about the other person. Do not even use the word you in your conversation when they're giving a personal weather report. Get in the habit of just being able to say, I deserve to take up space and draw breath. And I deserve to give a personal weather report. That's being assertive. Yes. <laughs> and and when, when we can accord that to ourselves, when we can actually see that that has value, we can start to allay our fears that I can communicate what's so for me and not be afraid that you'll run away. In fact, I'll be delighted if you run away and you shorten my search by taking yourself off my list. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, people say, when is it too soon to start asserting, to start asserting certain things? And Here's, you know, we just, I just finished my communications course and we had a man panel at the, at the last class. And the, one of the men was asked this, they were asked this question of when can I bring up what I want in a relationship? You know, what type of relationship I'm looking for? And I've told them all along, you say that right away. You tell them, mm -hmm. I'm looking for a serious relationship. How about you? You're not yeah. telling them that you were in love with them and you want to marry them. You just met them. But these are your standards. These are your standards. And I think people are afraid to say that because they think it means I am pressuring you to have a relationship with me. So don't say that. And and the other thing, you know, so anything, like if, if time is important to you, if, if accountability is important to you, um, you let the person know. And I think one of the hardest things with assertion is the tone of voice. So I think with without the proper skills, your tone of voice is often uh, pissy, you're holding back your anger. So you haven't really worked through what am I feeling? What am I needing? You're just launching into, you know, this is really hurtful. Yeah. Right, right. Stay away. So a boundary is not pushing you away. It's actually creating connection through protecting your own needs and values, um, keeping yourself sane. And if a person can comply with what you need and respects what you need, um, in addition to being able to assert what they need, and then you can begin a dialogue around that, then, then you you have a start of a healthy healthier relationship. Yeah, exactly. That's well said. Because if we're afraid to put out who we are and what we want, then the sky's the limit. We could get anything. Yeah. And who would have asked for that? Well, you would have because you didn't say what you were looking for. And therefore, you did not set the tone for where this relationship is going. And it's less than honest to not do that. You know, this whole idea of keeping your options open. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's a little bit overrated in so many ways when you get into the dating scene. Because if you're clear, as you say, I want a serious relationship. When I met my husband, I met him online. And in my profile, what stood out for him was I said, I want a world-class relationship. I won't settle for less. So if you're not willing to put in the time, don't contact me. Yeah. You know? Good like, for you. And wow. You know, there were people who didn't believe me, of course. You know? <laughs> <You have to laughs> but, what do you mean but, by that? <laughs> but my perfect mate 
read that line and said, me too. And he probably wanted to show you that he could be that guy. That's mm -hmm. the added advantage to stating your needs. The right guy says, oh, well, she's, she's a woman of value. Let me show her how I can be that man. Otherwise, you're just accepting crumbs. You're accepting whatever. You're hoping somebody's going to change. I, I, if I could really picture all the relationships I had before I met my husband, pretty much all of the ones that, where I liked a man, I would never open my mouth. I had no idea where I stood. And I never mm -hmm. trusted that I was loved because I, I was afraid to find out. So, I mean, I had one relationship that lasted a few months and it, it remained platonic for three months. I mean, we would saw each other all the time. He had me over for dinner. He made dinner. He gave me massages. I mean, we played ball together. We did everything together and it stayed platonic. And then I found out he was engaged. I was devastated. Devastated. Oh, wow. See, he had yes. been dating somebody the whole time. But I had no idea. Yeah, I thought he was going to be my husband. I was totally convinced. So, you know, it's like you can have a whole scene in your head, but if you never speak up and you never really say, this this doesn't work for me, here's what I really want. If that's if that's not going to work for you, that's, that's fine. But I have to go and find a person where it will work. And I just wrote about this for the um, Good Men Project last week. I wrote about red flags that you can pick up on the phone, on the first phone call. There are so many things that get said on a first phone call that you will not pick up in a text or in an email because email and text do not have tone. And you can sound amazing. People have these long relationships through word, spoke a written word. And then as soon as you speak or see each other, it's a completely different relationship. So mm -hmm. I, I advocate for seeing each other as soon as possible in an online dating kind of um, situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what happened with this guy is he sounded great in text and email. And I said, I'd love to talk. And he lived far away. So I wanted to make sure there was a connection worthy of, of really um, spending time on. And I told him that because he asked me, right? He was very upfront with me. He said, you know, we live far apart. Um, how do you feel about long distance? I said, if the connection is spectacular, I'm willing to put the effort in. So I was the one who asked to speak. And within a few minutes, I knew he was not for me. And one of the things that I picked up on right away is that he was very future oriented. He was basically calling me his girlfriend. Um, he was planning trips with me and um, telling me he wanted to talk every single night of the week. I mean, all these things where I felt like I was choking. And, um, and you know, I you can't. A relationship doesn't happen in one phone call. A, a relationship takes time to nurture and grow. And and um, and I just said, you know, I don't feel this the connection strong enough to continue. And he was surprised, but he said, okay, and that's it. We're done. We're done. No more time. I know in, in my heart that he is wrong for me. Um, as some other women may love that he wants to lock it down after a phone call, but... <laughs> Not me. <laughs> well, I think that that bears a little conversation right there, Sandy, because if you happen to be a person who recognizes in this minute that you like it locked down and you like that sense of power and control over you that, you know, I've got this and I am I'm giving it shape and I'm giving it meaning and I'm future pacing it you know, have a little radar there. You know, this show is called Improving Your Data, Dating yep. Radar. Have a little radar like, oh, would I like him to plan my weekends? Would I like him to decide what we're going to do? Would I like him to be speaking on my behalf? This is the road that he's charting here. So maybe you don't reject the person out of hand, but you ask questions about that, you know. I don't I, I don't feel comfortable when I feel like I'm not participating in decisions that are made. Uh, how do you feel about that? You know, and this would be an example. Um, I'm I, I don't think I engaged in a conversation about going there for the weekend or on that vacation, did I? Right. You know, you don't have to be harsh about it. You don't have to be demanding about it. You don't have to be calling people out. You can still be engaging in communication which is kind and honest at the same time, which is the hallmark that I give everyone for communication. 
there is are two words linked together in our language that I don't believe ever belong near each other, and that is brutal honesty. I think you can always be kind and honest at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, when you find that somebody is, is exhibiting a behavior, become curious about it. You used that word earlier. Yep. Ask questions. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not, you're not intruding. You're interested. And put it in that tone of voice and put it in those words that, wow, you know, do you really think that that would be something I'd enjoy? Tell me why. You know, find out what this person knows about you and what assumptions they're basing their decisions on. And that other person you might even find felt that, well, that's a, in your case, that she wanted a take charge kind of guy. And you, and you maybe let him off the hook that he doesn't have to be a take charge kind of guy. You just don't know where these things are going to go. Yeah. But if you don't speak up, then you are certainly not anywhere near in the driver's seat. Yeah. Yeah, very, very important. And that brutal honesty thing. Um, there was an article in the New York Times, I don't know if you saw it, um, I think over the weekend about authenticity. Like if you're not Oprah, um, authenticity is not the thing you want to bring to your first date or something like that. I, it was, I don't remember the exact, the exact words, but um, the author was talking about authenticity as, as brutal honesty. And I, I personally don't, I don't define authenticity in the same way. Um, mm -hmm. I think that we can be honest without being brutal. And I think that we also have to have a filter. <laughs> I think that we don't just blurt out everything, especially in a first phone call or a first date. Um, we, it's a slow build. And one of the things that I once heard Brene Brown say that I loved, I think she said it in a podcast, was that relationships are like um, twinkle lights. Um, so her twinkle lights that she has strung in her living room, it's like each time each time a friend um, does something that solidifies the relationship, you turn on another twinkle light in the long strand of twinkle lights. So it's not a disco ball, it's, it's, it's a little light and each light connects to the next light. And that's how I see relationships usually building in a healthy way. We don't have to turn on the entire, you know, 6,000 watts. Um, it's too much and we can't handle it, you know, and, and, it, and we need to build trust. We need to build something rather than just projection of who and that you want person to, is. Yes, and you want to know who they are uh, over, over time. You know, in my office here in my consulting room, I have in 12 inch gold letters what I consider to be the most important thing I can teach anyone. And what it says, Sandy, is the truth is what you do. So people can say anything, but if their behavior is not in alignment with what they say, be aware. Yep. Be watching for the behavior because a person's behavior is their belief, mm -hmm. not their words. Yep. So take your time, you know, watch. You want to see consistency over time. We can all be someone's idea of a difficult or crazy person every now and again. <laughs> We're under stress or, or, you know, whatever is going on. But it's who we are most of the time that matters. So take your time and watch for that. Yeah. So you can allay your fears. Like they don't have to like you and you can't make them like you. Those are two very, very dangerous statements that if I think everybody has to like me, I need to come and see me. <laughs> <laughs> we need to talk because that's very important. And if you think that that um, that other person has to like you and you've got to do everything that you can, go see, whoops, go see Sandy <laughs> because that's not true, right? That's just not true. You want to be selective and you want to be aware and you want to be in the moment and be able to stay present and not all future paced and walking down the aisle as soon as you see their face. You yeah, know? absolutely. Yeah, really important. And, you know, there are a lot more fears, Sandy, that we could discuss that, that people have and they've come by it naturally. And I just want to say again that if you've been in a relationship with what I call a chronically difficult person or you think you might have, you need special strategies and they're not easy to find. I've written about it a lot. I've got a couple of ebooks on Amazon. 
just put the word hijackal in Amazon. You'll find them because it's my trademark term. But also go to hijackals.com and there you can download my free ebook called How to Spot a Hijackal. And that can really help you in the dating world so that you know what to watch for. Even if you haven't had one in your life, you don't want one. So <laughs> you don't want one learn. anywhere in your life. No. Yeah. So, you know, don't 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 forget to learn how to spot them. Yeah, spot them. Because you don't want you don't want to spot them after you got them. Yeah, right. right? <laughs> <laughs> that was one of one of the most important books I read after my divorce was How to Spot a Dangerous Man Before You Get Involved. And uh -huh. it, it took me through like why I was involved. Um, you know, what about me? Um, created that those relationships. What about me drew myself to people who treated me the way they did? And yes. it was such an important thing. And it's one of the one of the things I help my clients with too. But I wanted to just before we get into other fears, I wanted to also just um, piggyback on something that you said about being the chooser. Because and, and you've re referenced that a few times just in, in a few different ways. Um, when, when you go on a date thinking, I hope they like me rather than I hope I like him or her, um, you know, the chooser, the chooser is, is at choice. The chooser is, um, the CEO of their love life. So you're sitting in that seat. And, and if you can imagine that you're in the seat of your own company, you're on a date, you're dating and you can hire or fire anybody, you know, you, you don't want to just let anybody in. Um, so that's back to the people pleaser when you want everybody to like you. Um, and I know from, you know, being a businesswoman as well as a person who's dating that I don't want to be liked by everybody. That means that I have no personality that I'm, I'm just going to please everyone, which will make me completely neutral. Um, I want to have opinions. I want to be me. And, and everyone should really strive to be more of who you are. Be more authentic. Don't try to wash yourself out to cast such a wide net that you're just going to have everybody fall into it because um, that's a dangerous place to go. And it's not fulfilling at all. Yeah. And I would piggyback on that very good advice by saying, don't be a chameleon. Don't mold yourself to the person in front of you. Mold yourself before you leave the house and stay in the mold. Yeah. Because one of the things that hijackals do is they will mold themselves to you. They they can read you. Um, and, and what I help my clients do, aside from giving up being hijackal bait, is to develop hadar, hijackal radar. Like you, you've got you've got to have that because they will just be the perfect person for you. They will. They are so good at calibrating your smiles and your nuances and everything, and they will mold themselves. And then they will keep working, keep working, keep working until they get you. And every day after that is a gotcha. So, you know, you have to be able to spot these people. And I really want you to be able to spot these people because life is valuable and you don't want to take 18 months or 18 years to finally realize you've got a hijackle by the tail and they've yep. got you by the throat. Absolutely. And, and not everybody shows up as so toxic. Like the ones, like the one I was referring to before, the person in my group, who fell for a, a really quality man. He was honest with her that he was not available. But what I would call that guy is quality casual. He's a quality guy, but he's casual about his dating. And he was casual with her feelings too. And so, mm -hmm. you know, when that happens, you need to be aware. Oh, we're on a different page. Um, and that goes for you if you're, if you're dating somebody who's newly widowed, who's newly out of a long-term relationship and, and may not be ready to form the kind of relationship that you want to be in. Know what you need, really know what you need. So that's really the, one of the most important things. But if we want to talk about some of the other fears, and I think that um, certainly dating, you know, fears of your biological clock is ticking if you're younger and, and your fear that you're running out of time. 
um, you can fear that as you get older, that dating is hard. Um, dating is harder because there just aren't any quality people anymore. They have so much baggage. Um, another fear is if I go online to date, um, something bad is going to happen. I'm going to get hurt. Um, so we can talk about a few of those if you want. Well, there certainly are a lot of them. I mean, let, and we don't have forever to talk about yeah. this, but, but we do want to put out a few things. So I would like to address the online dating because I think it's very, very important. And, you know, I, I like reality TV a little in small doses. And recently, uh, Sister Wives, uh, a woman, one of the wives was catfished online. And, you know, it's, it's something that you know, told the world you have to be careful at that moment. And yes, we have to be discerning. That's what we have to be. And if you don't have the ability, then get the ability to be discerning, to take off the familiar rose-colored glasses, but to take off the fear and, and be in that place that you spoke of so well, which is, this is who I am, and I'm not afraid to say it, and I'm not afraid to have you go away if you don't like it. But when you come from a place of fear that, A, I have to please you, B, I've got to snare somebody, um, C, I want to tell my friends how much somebody loves me, uh, even if I've never met them and they live you know, 86,000 miles away. Right. <laughs> and they're in prison. Uh, get, some help, get some help with that. Don't go around like that because that is just dangerous. That is dangerous territory for you. Um, and... You know, I think that people doing online dating need a lot of help. I think you need a lot of help to write a good profile that reflects what you want as opposed to trying to have everybody like you and want you. There's so many things. So what would you say is the biggest fear about online dating, Sandy? So I think the scammers um, are a big one, like you mentioned, the, the catfishers, the romance scammers. And, and I want to say that... Um, it, you don't have to be um, a person who's clueless to have this happen to you. It happens to the most intelligent, um, incredible people who, again, want to believe so badly that this person is the right person for them. Because, again, they're like the hijackles. They will know how to say the exact words that will pull at your heartstrings. They'll find the mm -hmm. vulnerable women or men who just want to believe that um that this person is your true love even if they're mm -hmm. not in they're not even real um there was an npr thing i heard once a long time ago where a really smart reporter fell in love with a robot who was in like russia i mean he the robot knew how to echo the words and mirror him so well that he fell in love and i mean people have sent so much money so it's, there's so much written, and I've written about this a lot on my blog. So if you just, you know, go into my blog, there's there's stuff about dating dangerous people, about romance scammers. Um, so that's that's the first one. And, and I would say it's not so common, you know, this catfishing and romance scammers makes up a very small percentage of what happens on online dating that's horrible. Um, the other thing is, you know, people fib. Um, there's big fibs and there's small fibs. And so the, the ones that I call like white lies are men tend to fib more about their height and women tend to fib more about their age. Um, I don't think these are and huge. Their weight. And their weight, yes. I think everybody fibs about their weight, their age. Um, I think a lot of people are just a legend in their own mind. And I think <laughs> that people really get sort of this notion that they're so young and Everybody, if you look at online dating, everybody's younger than the next person. I feel and look younger than my age. I feel 20 years younger. Great. You know, it's great that we all feel so vibrant and young, but you have to really meet the person and see what they're like in person. So again, it's the energy exchange that happens on a first date. Or if you're far away and you, you're okay with long distance dating, get on the phone and then get on a, on a video chat you know, really get to the next level because you don't want to build and build and build and project. Um, another fear with online dating, um, it's, I think the biggest thing is it's so overwhelming for people. And now there are so many phone apps that limit the amount of people you see, like Bagel Meets Coffee. 
or coffee meets bagel. I forget which which goes first, <laughs> but it's um, they give you one match a day. That's doable. You know, you either pass or you know you like them. A um, couple others like Tinder. Tinder has a bad rap. It was always known as a hookup site, and um, people find love on every single site and every single app. So you really have to find out what works for you and not be afraid to go in there with with a great profile, you know, show up and be the best you can be. Um, I write profiles. I do online dating support at lastfirstdate.com. And, uh, you know, it's it, it's just get support. Don't don't think that you have to do it all yourself. It's, you know, getting the right support squad, whether you work with someone like Roberta and or work with someone like me, you know, you want you want to know that you're coming in the healthiest you can be. That's Roberta's website for relationshiphelp.com. And um, you know, get get the best photos out there. That the selfies, oh my god, like stop with the selfies. There's so I, many where it's in the bathroom mirror and it's I don't want to see your toilet, really. <laughs> can I just add something yeah. right there? Know that you don't have to sell yourself by selling sex in your selfie. Oh, my God. Yes. You know, I don't know where this, well, I do, but I'm going to say <laughs> I don't know where it comes from. That It seems to be that everybody's got to put a picture up with as much body exposed. You know, I remember when I was online dating, which is a long time ago now, but, you know, the guys posing without a shirt next to their sports car or a a sports car they're hoping you're assuming is there right. um, or the woman with the cleaving the shot from above and the coquettishness and everything unless you're selling sex don't sell yourself short in yeah. your pictures that you post absolutely I'm so glad you said that because you first of all if you don't want to be objectified as a body as a sex object then don't put yourself out there like that really be consistent with your authenticity, who you are, and the right person will take notice. But really show up. I mean, show up in all your glory, you know, bring your best self. So if you have hobbies, take a picture of you doing your hobby, take a picture of you traveling, you know, they're stories, they're little stories that people can then comment on. The problem with a lot of online dating profiles is people don't tell enough. They list a whole bunch of adjectives, I'm, I'm creative, I'm athletic, I'm smart. I went to a really good school. Um, I'm a lawyer. I, I make a lot me, of money. I make a lot of money, right? I'm financially secure and I'm this and I'm that. And it's like what they think. I'm tall because I know that matters to women. Um, you know, it's like, okay, you can be shorter and I could fall in love with you because your height isn't going to be enough to pull me in. It's, it's, it is attractive to a lot of women. I hate to say it, but really, mm -hmm. please don't. Please don't overlook uh, values and character over the outside, the shiny stuff that people put out there. Let me put a little interjection there. I had a friend who spent a lot of money on an introduction site, you know, that actually in town she was going to have all these dates. And it was expensive, like $10,000, and she was going to meet X number of people over such a period of time. And one of the criteria she had was they had to be over six feet tall. And she started going on these dates and she would call me after them and she would say, I don't know what that service was thinking. That guy was never six feet tall. And I said, well, but did you learn about him? Oh, well, I'm not going out with a guy who's not six feet tall. I said, you know, you've really, you've really thrown your money away. Yeah. Because you are just dispensing with every human being who's not over six feet or over you don't really want a guy, you want a measuring stick. And she would, you know, she got really angry with mm -hmm. me. But after after a while, she realized that she didn't meet anybody. She's still alone. And that was five years ago. Because that criteria is meaningless yep. for having someone who has your back, who is interested in you, who can love you and support you, and you can have a mutually supportive and loving relationship. An inch or two in height doesn't matter at all. I'm not sure an inch or two anywhere else does either, but <laughs> don't make it about height, right? Yeah. And when the lights are out and you're in bed together, you won't notice. 
pits right and did. when you're sitting down you won't notice either. yes you won't yeah and i had a woman contact me who was in her 70s and only wanted to date men with a full head of hair <laughs> i was just like good luck with that yeah. um, and i said if i worked with you i would not let that be on your list i'm just telling you now that's that's criteria that is totally meaningless in a relationship you might be attracted to that you know, let him get a toupee. I don't know. <laughs> that swings, you know, floats your boat. Why should he have to? Exactly. You know? Right. These things don't matter. So, so a lot of the fears um, that we have are unfounded. They are just their projections. Um, the fear, I'm too old. Um, I'm, I'm too heavy. I'm too thin. I'm too wrinkled. I mean, I, I came into dating with a lot of those fears too. I, I had just gotten out of a divorce two years before. I was petrified of online dating, but I knew if I didn't date online, I wouldn't meet anybody, right? I mean, I wasn't dating and nobody had set me up. And, and Prince Charming wasn't making no, house calls. He wasn't making house <laughs> calls and, and my male person is a woman. So I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't dating her. And um, yeah, there were really, I work at home. I really don't, I don't have opportunity to come in contact with that many men. So it was, a, it was a great opportunity. And remember that online dating is a tool to get you to date, not to stay online. <laughs> it's to get you offline. And, um, and the more you do anything, especially if you're learning, you have to learn from each date, from each thing that happens instead of saying, oh, it doesn't work. Um, so many people quit before ever knowing if it worked or not because they, didn't, they never put the effort in. They never got the right profile up. They never got the nice pictures. They have no idea how to email. Women who are passive and waited for men to email them. Uh, that happens all the time. And this is not about taking the lead, ladies. This is about flirting. It's about putting a green light on. It's about saying, hey, let's start a conversation. That's it. You see right. what I'm saying? It's like having that conversation about whether you want to be in a serious relationship or not. It's not saying with you, it's, you know, so it's the same thing. <laughs> saying where I'm at, yeah. yeah. And, you know, if you want to learn more about Sandy, go to lastfirstdate.com because I want to say something about all that. If I had my druthers in this world and I were giving you, the listener, advice, I would say get yourself together before you put yourself out. Because if, especially if you have been divorced, you've got healing to do, you've got recalibration to do, you've got realignment to do. Do that before you get all involved in getting out there and looking for something. That's where I help people. Yeah. Help you get yourself together and know who you are and know what you want so that you can then get all the skills that Sandy has and the considerations that she has. So my task is in the healing and the preparation. And then over to you to say, okay, here's how. Here's what you need to think about. Here's where you need to go. Here's what not to do. So very important. And I want to prevent people from, from getting in relationships with those people I call hijackals. And they come in the male and the female variety. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, my practice is, is global. I have people all over the world that I work with because of this specialty. And I want you to know how to spot a hijackal. So go to hijackals.com and download my free ebook so that your HADAR is working. Mm -hmm. So, Sandy, we could talk about this a lot. And next week, we're going to have a new topic for folks. Uh, I'm so glad that, that you joined us, Barat and Candy and others. Love to uh, have you join us again. Be sure to subscribe to our blog. This is Improving Your Dating Radar. And uh, my co-host is Sandy Wiener from lastfirstdate.com. Any parting words, Sandy? Uh, just value yourself. I couldn't agree with you more. Really take care of yourself. And don't expect anybody to rescue you, to you know, make up for any of the deficits that you have. You know, People can compliment you. And they, they will have skills and, and qualities that you don't have. And that's wonderful. But you want to value yourself first. And the more you value yourself, the more you're going to radiate out the amazing love you have for yourself. 
And it's going to make dating so much better. <laughs> it's fun, actually, when you do the work. Absolutely. I mean, meeting people is great when you are feeling centered and good. Yes. And that's my job. And I'm going to help you do that if you come in and we talk. Know that you can have a free consultation so you can sign up at forrelationshiphelp.com. Yep. And the last thing that I would say is remember when you're watching folks, be paying attention to what they do and whether it matches what they say. Absolutely. Don't get sucked in by the words. So, Sandy, until we're together again next week, I hope that everything goes smoothly in the dating world and <laughs> everywhere else for all of us. Bye, everybody. Bye. Mm -hmm.